it out and wrap it up and finish at T minus five minutes. And then at T minus three minutes, as the booster finishes loading, the vehicle will be fully loaded with just over 10 million pounds propellant. Now, currently in the countdown, we've just passed the T minus 26 minute mark. The good news is weather's looking good. You can see the blue skies there on the camera views from the drone. The only thing we're watching is winds. They are within limits at ground level. Uh, we expect they may pick up a little bit as we get farther into the window should we need to go that far. But the good news right now is that the weather is looking good. The range also is looking pretty good. We've moved almost all the boats out of the keep out zone overnight. We are working one, but we're still underway. And right now is a reminder, if for any reason we do not make our test flight today, we have backup launch windows. This could be either 24 or 48 hours after today, and it'll depend on how far we get into the countdown. But coming up on 25 minutes to go, everything is looking good, Kate. In order to make life multi-planetary, we need a fully reusable vehicle that's capable of carrying a huge amount of cargo and a lot of people to orbit and have a pretty quick turnaround. The idea is to effectively reuse launch vehicles just like airplanes. <laughs> Crowd is getting excited here uh, in Hawthorne uh, behind Mission Control, as you can hear. Now, imagine if you had to wait for a new airplane to be constructed every time you wanted to fly. You'd rarely go anywhere, and it would probably be completely unaffordable for most of us. In order for us to get to Mars and back with lots of people multiple times, reusability is a must. Now, in the near term and a bit closer to home here on Earth, Starship will be critical to other programs as well. Once it's operational, Starship will deliver the full-size and upgraded version of our Starlink satellites. And that's super exciting because our next-generation satellites represent a step forward in Starlink's capabilities and will provide more bandwidth and increased reliability to connect millions of people around the world with high-speed internet. And of course, Starship will fly a number of human spaceflight missions in the lead up to our first missions to Mars. Entrepreneur and pilot Jared Isaacman will command the first human spaceflight on Starship as part of the Polaris program. Jared served as a commander for Inspiration4, the first all civilian mission to orbit. Inspiration4 launched aboard our Dragon spacecraft and Falcon 9 in September 2021, raising over $240 million for St. Jude Children's Research Hospital. The first human spaceflight on Starship will launch as part of the Polaris program, and you can learn more about that series of missions at polarisprogram.com. Now, our first lunar mission uh, around the moon aboard Starship will be led by Japanese entrepreneur Yusaku Maizawa, also known as MZ. MZ flew to space for the first time in December 2021, purchasing, and he purchased all of the seats aboard Starship's first lunar mission in order to give artists and creators from all over the world the opportunity to go. And the hope is that what they will create in space will further inspire all of us here back on planet Earth. Now, over a million people applied for this mission, and earlier this year, they announced the final eight crew members were selected, and you can learn more about them and MZ's mission at dearmoon.earth. Dennis and Akiko Tito are the first two crew members announced to fly on Starship's second commercial space flight around the moon. This will be Dennis's second mission to space after becoming the first commercial astronaut to visit the International Space Station in 2001. And Akiko will be among the first women to fly around the moon on a starship. The Titos joined the mission to contribute to SpaceX's long-term goal to advance human spaceflight and help make life multiplanetary. SpaceX is also incredibly honored to be part of NASA's Artemis program to establish a sustainable presence on the moon to prepare for missions to Mars. Starship's early test launches, followed by those regular Starlink deployment missions and propellant transfer demonstrations, are directly advancing NASA's Artemis program, along with SpaceX's ongoing mission to make life multiplanetary. SpaceX will conduct an uncrewed demonstration mission to the moon prior to the Artemis 3 mission, which will mark humanity's first return to the lunar surface in more than 50 years. It's an exciting future, but let's talk a little about how we got to today. Now, Starship testing ramped up in July of 2019 with the Star Hopper prototype. It's sort of a, a short version of the Starship that we see today. There's a picture of it on your screen, the lovable water tower. 
Now, standing at just over 18 meters tall, the Starhopper had a single engine and was test flown to perform landing and low level altitude maneuvers. Starship's initial flight test was a hop that reached about 20 meters in altitude. This was followed by a second hop, the one that we've got on our screen, that rose to 150 meters in altitude. We uh, took a little jaunt away from the launch pad and ended up landing about 100 meters or so further away from it. And you can see that on your screen. Now, notably, this was the first time that we had used a Raptor engine in flight and demonstrated control of this kind. As a Star Wars fan, I can't not see a flying R2-D2 there. <laughs> <laughs> now, after a series of 150-meter hop tests with earlier prototypes, the Starship program saw a huge breakthrough during a test flight of the vehicle known as Serial Number 8, or SN8. SN8 demonstrated a first-of-its-kind controlled aerodynamic descent and landing flip maneuver. Yes, I'm talking about the belly flop. <laughs> this 12.5-kilometer hop test took place December 2020 and saw the SN8 prototype ascend to an altitude of 12.5 kilometers and conduct a belly flop maneuver. While it didn't stick the landing, the test was a major milestone in the development of Starship. I love seeing the belly flop maneuver. Now, testing continued with the prototype on serial number nine. That was a 10-kilometer flight test in February of 2021. We had a nominal ascent, engine cutoff, reorientation, and controlled descent were stable. However, we unfortunately had a dramatic ending to the end of that flight when we had a failure on its engine to relight. That resulted in one of those rapid unscheduled disassemblies. But what was really, really exciting about both serial numbers eight and nine is how quickly we were able to achieve just our primary objectives in those two high altitude test flights. In addition to getting lots of great data, Starship successfully demonstrated control of the vehicle and subsonic reentry capability. Ultimately, we, perf we performed nine Starship high altitude test flights in total. And in May of 2021, SN15 launched from Starbase, reached an altitude of about 10 kilometers, performed a number of maneuvers, and safely returned to the launch site. This was the first Starship prototype to fly, control its descent, safely land, and to be recovered in one piece. Now, so having achieved that success in our suborbital campaign, one of the next big challenges for upper stage reusability is to survive the high heating hypersonic phase of entry. Combined with the ability to refill our Starship's tank with fuel and oxygen while on orbit is what will enable a fully reusable transportation system that's designed to carry both crew and cargo on these long duration interplanetary flights. And that's ultimately what will help humanity return to the moon and travel to Mars and beyond in our solar system. So as you can tell, it is nothing but an iterative process uh, in, to get to the point that we are today and where we will go from here. Um, that iteration is a core process of how we work here at SpaceX. We like to fly uh, and we like to test early and often, uh, both on the uh, side of hardware and software. Yeah, that's an awesome point, Kate. Now, we are continuing our countdown to Starship liftoff just over 17 minutes from now. So, of course, let's check in with John for another status update. John. Thanks, Shiva. Clock is coming up on T-minus 17 minutes from liftoff. We're continuing to click towards zero. However, right now, we've just begun listening in. The first stage team is working a pressurization issue. They're troubleshooting that right now. Now, we do have the option, if need be, if we can't solve this, then we would hold the count and probably treat today as a wet dress and not be able to launch. However, we are continuing to do propellant loading on both the Super Heavy and the ship stages. Now, most recently, we began loading liquid oxygen and methane fuel into the header tanks on Starship. At the very top, just underneath the nose there, there are two small spherical tanks. That's where the fuel and liquid oxygen header tanks are. That started at T minus 27 minutes, and that propellant loading will continue until T minus nine minutes. We'll also continue loading the main tanks of the Starship second stage, although they're pretty much full right now. Everything will drain back as we get ready for launch at T minus five minutes. Now on the first stage, we're continuing to load the massive amount of propellant onto the super heavy booster. That's gonna continue until T minus three minutes, 
you can see the frost line on some of the views as both liquid methane and liquid oxygen go into the tank. It's 16 minutes and counting. We're also currently configuring the launch pad for liftoff. The booster hold downs are being prepared for the release at liftoff. And the second stage quick disconnect is beginning its configuration for release. The liquid oxygen and methane that are going into the second stage go through that quick disconnect. You can see it in some of the views, the arm that comes out just to the base of the second stage. Now it'll move out of the way as we lift off. At the same time, the SpaceX team continues to check in with the Coast Guard. We're working one boat that's in the safety perimeter. They are working to get that boat out of the way. We cleared several, hour, several other boats out overnight. We're down to one and we expect that'll be clear so that we can proceed with launch out over the Gulf of Mexico. But as a reminder, T minus 15 minutes, 10 seconds and counting. We are working an issue on the first stage and we'll bring an update as we get more insight into that issue. Now, today's test flight is taking place out of our Starbase facility in South Texas. And that facility has gone through a tremendous amount of change and growth in a really short period of time. Yeah, I mean, three years ago, not much even existed there. Um, it was a very different scene, as you can uh, see by that photo there on your screen. Uh, fast forward to today, and the team is building out an entire production line. Yeah, last year they built four Starship Super Heavy boosters, five Starships, our 200 Raptor 2 engine, and this year they're targeting five boosters, eight star and eight Starships in production for 2023. And really, you do need a production system to rapidly iterate, like we were talking about earlier, on the design of the vehicle as we learn more about it from these large tests. Yeah, absolutely. Um, pulling on my industrial engineering background, system fill is something that is critical to that goal. Um, being able to produce and launch multiple Starships means that we have to have a system full of those production vehicles and we iterate on each one. So even the next Starship that will fly in whatever the next test is will be different than the one that you see there on your screen now. Now the employees who have been at SpaceX a while say that Starbase does remind them of the early Falcon 1 days except moving a whole lot faster. The team at Starbase is expanding as fast as the facilities are. And if you've ever wondered what life at Starbase is like, here's a quick. Starbase directly employs more than 1,800 employees and is actually the largest employer in the area. Yeah, and from that video, you can really tell like it's a beautiful location. It's close to the ocean. There's tons of wildlife. And that's because being close to the equator is actually a fantastic way to get to orbit. Yeah, I love that we have so many employee events that allow us to participate uh, with ocean cleanup and other environmental efforts uh, there. Uh, we'd also like to thank Cameron County for being so supportive uh, for all of our work in that area. Now, in addition to Starbase, we'll soon be adding another Texas location to the SpaceX family. 
We're opening a new facility in Bastrop, Texas, just outside of Austin to support Starlink hardware production. The new facility will be over 500,000 square feet of manufacturing space, and the team has already started hiring. Now we have all kinds of openings in production and manufacturing for technicians and leadership and manufacturing engineers and all kinds of site support roles. Basically, if you can think of a role, we're probably hiring for it. So if you're interested in helping expand human life to other planets or helping Internet access here on Earth, consider becoming part of the SpaceX team at SpaceX.com slash careers. Now with that, let's tap it back in with Zach down at Starbase one last time before launch. Howdy, Zach. Hello, Kate and Shiva again. You can really feel the energy here at South Padre Island as more of the SpaceX team have gathered. Uh, we're standing just over five miles away from the launch mount. And so from here, we've got a very nice view. Um, I, I would basically say these are some of the best front row seats you could get. And might I add beachside as well. Now, the Starship team has worked incredibly hard to get ready for this test, and we're all clearly excited for T0. And as we get into the final moments, one issue that could hold the countdown or cancel the test altogether is if a boat enters the safety perimeter. Now, over my shoulder is the Gulf of Mexico, which is normal, normally, normally very open to all of the boaters and fishers. Um, however, today, SpaceX is closely coordinating with the United States Coast Guard to establish a safe zone and ensure public safety. And up to T0, SpaceX is in regular com communication with the Coast Guard to ensure there are no boats in the area leading up to the launch. Now, fingers crossed that that does not happen. Now, I'll throw it back to the folks at Hawthorne as we get closer and closer to that T minus zero. We're just inside T minus nine minutes and counting. We're listening on one of the background lists right now. Flight director is talking about the issue we had on first stage, uh, working the pressurization system. Decision right now is that we are going to stop the way, we're going to transition the launch attempt to a mid dress rehearsal. So that means we're going to continue with the countdown sequence of events. We'll continue loading propellant, finishing up here shortly on the second stage. We'll also continue loading propellant onto the first stage, wrapping up at T minus three minutes. We're also going to go through pressurization steps, other steps of the countdown. This will be a full validation for the team, but currently the plan right now is we're waiting for final word, is that at, I think at T minus 10 seconds, we will finally stop the clock and then recycle the countdown for today. Now we're inside T minus eight minutes and counting. We're continuing to load propellant on both the first and second stage. You can see the Starship second stage with the heat shield tiles there. Carriage arms are open. You can see the condensation around the first stage tank as we load liquid methane, the liquid oxygen into the large super loading is continuing until T minus three minutes. As a reminder, Alan, there's our great view looking up at the Raptor engines, the 33 engines. There's an outer ring of 20 engines, and then there's an inner set of 13. Those are the engines that can gimbal and adjust the course of the Starship vehicle on the way up. And of course, the first stage as it comes back down towards the uh, water landing in the Gulf of Mexico. Now, when both stages are loaded, you can see the condensation frost on the side of the first stage. We'll have just over 10 million pounds of liquid propellant on board. Inside T minus seven minutes, we're continuing to count. Team is preparing for the hold and scrub at T minus 10 seconds. Now, the good news is everything's been going good. We're just working that one issue. Uh, so we are continuing to count. Team will get this as an excellent opportunity to run the end to end of the system. Now in a launch, in the next few minutes, the guidance system would be performing its final alignment. We will be doing that this morning. The automated flight termination system would be armed. Uh, we won't need to arm it today as we won't be flying and we'll do final thrust vector control checkouts, what we call wiggles of the Raptor engines on the first and second stages. Now, normally in a countdown, if we needed to hold, 
Here's a view of the second stage reactor engines, just above the first stage. Now, as I mentioned, in a reactor, and if we needed to hold, that would come at T minus 40 seconds. That's the point in the countdown where we can pause to wait for final checkups or pressurization to complete. Now, early this morning, we thought we might have to hold it 40 seconds. Everything's looking good. Uh, except for the one pressurization issue, the team is going to have to troubleshoot after this morning. So we won't stop at 40 seconds right now. We'll continue all the way down to 10 seconds, and then we'll go into a recycle. John, you mentioned that we're going to be jumping into a wet dress rehearsal here. And I actually think we're coming up T minus five minutes. Uh, overall, though, hey, Chiva, it's been a good day. It's a little sad listening to the uh, flight director say that we're going to have to stop at 10 seconds. But uh, I guess that's for everybody. It gives us a real run through of the launch vehicle. Yeah, uh, it's unfortunate. Of course, we wanted to <laughs> see fire today and lift off uh, of the count. Are going to to work through it and we are going to uh, hold, uh, basically call it off at T minus 10 seconds but the integrated launch teams and us we are going to treat this as if it were still a launch day we're going to do this